Welcome to the Truth Over Comfort Show. Today's guest is Kevin Booth. He's here to talk about Bill Hicks and some of the documentaries he's done over the years about the drug war. He did two. They're excellent. I recommend everyone to watch them. And we can also kind of get into more detail about the whole drug war itself. So thank you for being here today, Kevin. How are you doing? Good. Doing all right. How are you? Great. Thank you. Actually, so kind of, if you... Uh, things are things are kind of roasting here. We're in Texas right now under this heat dome. And uh, so it kind of feels like the end of the world. So we better better do this interview before we all melt. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be summer right now in England, but it's actually been raining pretty much the whole of July. Uh, but yeah, so if, if you just want to tell people kind of who you are and your work, and then we can kind of get onto the, the next topics. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I um, started off uh, as a musician. Uh, as a young kid, I was more into the production side of things. And then with my association through Bill, I actually became a bass player because he needed a bass player. And so I started playing bass at an early age and that that kind of took off. And then uh, Bill Hicks and I kind of went our own separate ways for a little while. Uh, I joined another band, but then came back and started working with him and his comedy and worked with Bill for many years. And then after Bill passed away, I uh, kind of took it off into a more political direction. I mean, the last thing I ever did with Bill was covering the the Branch Davidian Waco story. And so the last thing I ever did with Bill was suddenly getting a little more political, controversial, conspiratorial. Um, and it was at that point I, I worked for a couple of years with the dreaded Alex Jones, who got me deep into all kinds of conspiratorial things. We, we did a couple of films together. This was back when Alex was just truth to power guy, anti George Bush, anti Iraq war, anti FBI burning down the Branch Davidians. Um, and at that, and at a point, I decided I wanted to go solo, wanted to do my solo album, and that's when I did American Drug War. It was my first solo uh, venture into doing a documentary completely by myself, just because you know I just wanted to be in control of everything and. That kind of took off and led me in a whole direction where I, I made several drug war documentaries. I ended up uh, getting hired to, to lecture at universities all across the country. And that's about it. Now I find myself out of Hollywood right now and um, I'm back on the ranch in Texas. Same same ranch where all the Bill Hicks stuff took place, all the UFO stories and everything just right out the window here. And just uh, developing some other TV shows right now. and. That's about it. I don't. I don't know. That's that's me. Sorry, my camera keeps going. I'm not sure why. I'll have a look in a second. But just since you brought up, uh, we don't need to dwell on it for uh, for too long. Just since you mentioned Alex Jones, what what was he like, kind of back then, working with him and kind of as a person? Alex was hilarious. He probably still is. Uh, you know, it's what a, what a weird story, right? I mean, uh. uh Back in the day when I was working with Bill, we were at a public access channel, Austin Access Television, and I don't know if they have public access TV in England. And um, it, you know, there was a lot of lot of great things happening there. Bill and I were working on uh, a dumb karate movie and a bunch of other ideas. We we're working on one of his uh, comedy concerts, and just we were working on a bunch of things right th back then. And then this young guy suddenly appeared out of nowhere doing this bizarre talk show where he would sit in front of a star map and just talk about all these conspiratorial things, but it wasn't really connecting the dots. This was before New World Order talk, and Bill was kind of talking New World Order. You know, Bill was one of the first people I ever know to, to be talking about the New World Order. And it just kind of happened where Bill and I were doing the Waco Branch Davidian story, and then when Bill passed away, suddenly Alex was there and he was actually helping the Branch Davidians finance a new church. So I started going to Waco with them and we started up a friendship and actually we became good friends. I was actually the best, one of the best men at his first wedding, <laughs> believe it or not. And I did a, um, a film called Martial Law with him and another film called American Dictators uh, I did with him. And uh, you know, he was back then. Alex, Alex was a really 
funny, crazy. I mean, he, he was kind of like what you would imagine he was, but he was actually a really loyal, sweet guy, uh, very passionate, also very probably one of the funniest people you've ever gone if you ever go out drinking with friends. If you have like crazy friends you go out drinking with, you can only imagine. Uh, so I had some had some crazy adventures with Alex. I mean, I found myself one time on a, a cigarette boat uh, in uh, Manhattan uh, chasing with uh, Homeland Security chasing us. So we actually outran a Homeland Security boat and all this while we're drinking liquor straight out of a bottle going 120 miles an hour in a boat and ended up in a fist fight on the dock because <laughs> a camera fell in the water. And I mean, it's just some crazy memories with Alex, some funny, crazy memories. And then years and years later, um, filming a shooting a film overseas i start talking about alex and people start telling me all about sandy hook and i'm like what i don't even know what sandy hook was and everybody starts like well the sandy hook thing the sandy hook thing i've been completely out of just out of the circle and then I, you know i don't i don't know i don't know what happened <laughs> so yeah yeah i mean from the background he kind of looks like a pretty funny guy and uh, another kind of figure who, who's really brief in, in your documentary uh the American drug war the last white hope was was Joe Rogan so kind of what was your relationship with him do you do you have any relationship with yeah. him because you've never been on his podcast well you know Joe was like a, a getting started as a comedian he had done a show called talk radio and uh he was a big fan of an album I did called Rantney Minor with Bill and he, he actually looked me up and we started working together and I, I filmed a uh, uh, a comedy concert of Joe in Austin at the same club that I did uh, Bill Hicks Sane Man. I shot a thing called Joe Rogan Belly of the Beast and this was back, this was pre 9-11 and I remember we made a DVD out of it. I remember back in those days to make a DVD it was like super complicated. I mean you had to hire a computer programmer to make the DVD menu and to figure out how to make it all work. It was crazy. So we I actually, we made a DVD of it. It was low budget production, but it's still fun to go back and, and work on. And so Joe and I did some stuff. We, you know, continued on. He was in my film and all that. And, you know, I kept up with Joe for many years. I know he's he's in Austin now. I, uh, I, haven't, I haven't talked to him in a long time. And I know be, through me, like he and Alex Jones actually started up a, a kooky relationship. I, I introduced Alex to, to Joe in the very beginning when when uh, Alex was like saying he didn't want to meet any of my degenerate Hollywood friends. <laughs> I was like, no, you got to meet this Joe Rogan. You'll like him. And then they ended up being good friends. So, yeah, I know I know Alex has been on his show many times. Yeah, did you did you ever want to go on his show to kind of talk about the drug war, your documentaries, or just kind of in general, you know, as a friend? Uh, you know, I've never he's never asked me, so you know, I don't know. It's kind of he's kind of gone off in a different circle, and so have I, you know, and so you know, such is life. Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, it's pretty incredible that you know you kind of obviously knew Bill Hicks, and you know you've kind of produced the documentaries after then and then she linked up with Alex Jones and then you connecting with Joe Rogan it's quite quite a bunch of people to, to be involved with uh it's you know pretty impressive um yeah so kind of going back to kind of Bill Hicks so how did your relationship start with him because from the documentary I watched uh, as I mentioned to you before we started uh I think it's called Bill Hicks the story in 2009 am I correct you met him in around like ninth grade some sometime around then Yes, I was, he was in, I was in 10th grade, he was in 9th grade, and uh, Stratford High School, West Houston, back in the very early 70s, when Houston was kind of a oil boom town, most everybody's dads had something to do with the energy companies. My dad was an electrical guy. Bill's dad owned a, uh, a or was working in a big car dealership. He was like a big General Motors guy, ended up having his own dealership. Uh, and Bill and his friend Dwight Slade were just these two really kooky kids that came to the school and they, they would almost bait the jocks and all that, the assholes to like mess with them. Uh, and they would do, they, I don't know, they would just do crazy things to attract attention. Everybody thought they were like insane. And I thought they were hilarious. And so we started hanging out together and before you knew it, and Bill, Bill and Dwight were huge Kiss fans, and they they loved Kiss. 
So my older brother, uh, had, he was like nine years older than me. He played in a lot of rock bands back when we lived in Los Angeles. And we had uh, a lot of musical instruments and everything in my house. And my brother was gone. We had this big house with all the stuff in it. So we started, Bill started coming over to my house and we started just playing music together. So the whole relationship started with a, a band called Stress. And we played um, high school uh, talent shows, high school keg parties. And we had a thing called the Stratford Senior Party Team where we had actually, um, it's crazy to think back then, I, we were like 15 years old buying 20 kegs of beer and charging people money to get into sell, selling. We were selling beer when we were like little kids. That's how different things were back then. Uh, and we would, and so we would, we would perform at these, at these concert, at these, uh, at these high school parties. And that went on for a couple of years. And then I, I graduated one year before Bill and Bill stayed. And that's when he became, you know, he was becoming more serious about comedy. And then I actually, um, started playing in another band with some other guys from my high school. We became a band called year zero that we ended up signing a deal with Chrysalis records that did yeah i think it's a british label they did uh jethro toll you know they it was like a big big british label and um you know but we we kind of just kept the course going and then i ended up producing uh well i didn't produce bill's very first album dangerous but then i produced relentless and all of the rest of his records and i produced his first uh like feature length stand-up comedy concert and then, and then we ended up doing a band together called Marblehead Johnson that was actually recorded in a really nice studio, some good music. And so we just, we collaborated on a lot of things. And, oh, and we made a really, a really bad karate movie. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Can I just quickly sort my camera? I, I don't know if you can see it. It keeps going black and I don't really want to kind of ruin the whole interview because people might kind of give up on it. I'm not sure why it's doing this. I apologize. So just give me a minute doing obviously music uh with bill and white so kind of from, from what point were when you was creating music together did bill kind of go off to, to do comedy and uh, how could how did his comedy kind of evolve from the first time you saw him with white where they're kind of well, doing bill, characters I mean, well bill was yeah. always a comedian i mean he was that was part of what the attraction I mean, he was he was always he was a comedian at school he was a comedian he was just always kind of funny not not that he was performing like he was doing his act but he was just always hilarious but at school he was you know you could tell he he was more than just a funny kid you know what i mean you got you have a lot of friends that can make people laugh people that think they can be comedians because they can make their friends laugh and then every so often you'll meet someone that has the ability to make everybody laugh or you know there's they're able to take things and put a new spin on a new dimension on it and so I remember, uh, as the story goes, I mean, because I, I was able to get my driver's license when I was really young because we have a, a ranch, and I was able to get this thing called a hardship driver's license when I was 14 years old. And Bill, we were going to a guitar shop in downtown Houston. And so when we were living in, when you're 14 or 15 years old and you live in West Houston, going to downtown was like a pretty big deal. I mean, it was a big city, and I, you know, for me to drive to downtown was kind of a scary prospect um so we drove downtown to this guitar store and i think it was then when we drove past the comedy workshop and that's when bill and Dwight were like comedy workshop we read about that place and so uh we went in there and then they met all these guys and everybody there at the comedy workshop i mean they were all they were you know they, they were like way older than us i mean we were we were like you know we were like little kids and these guys were I mean, I don't want to sit here and say they're like way older than us, but they're you know they were like nightclub guys. You know what I mean, they were drinking drinking straight whiskey and hanging out in nightclubs, smoking cigarette guys. And Bill is just baby faced. I mean, just like a babe, a little babe. And Bill, in his old days, I mean, he would never touched alcohol, cigarettes. I mean, he you know in the very beginning he was. You know, I, I, most of my friends drank beer and party and all that. Bill was super anti everything. And he and Dwight were into uh, transcendental meditation and yoga and completely different than any of my other friends, right? And so now here we are going to this nightclub into this place where everybody's smoking and drinking. And 
I guess uh, um, I think the first guy we met was a guy named Steve Epstein, who's still around. You know, maybe he'll see this interview. Uh, and they call themselves the Texas Outlaws, Texas uh, Comic Outlaws. I hope I'm saying that right. It's been so while. Outlaws of Comedy. Texas Outlaws of Comedy, uh, this group of guys. And they had open mic nights there. So Bill signed up for open mic nights, Bill and Dwight. And when they first started doing it, Bill and Dwight would go on stage as a comedy duo. So I believe Bill's first uh, times on stage were was together with Dwight. And it was, a, you know, the two of them together. And then really quickly after that, they started going up separately. And it just went on from that. And then, and then Dwight's dad... Uh, got transferred to Portland, Oregon, and then their family moved, and then their bill was kind of solo. And so uh, at that point, you know, his whole life was just comedy and music. And it was kind of like a like a race about what he was going to do with his life. I mean, he was a great guitar player, and he wanted to be – he wanted to be a musician. I think, he, I think he probably fantasized a lot more about being a rock star than a famous comedian. Uh, but it was when the um, – the, um, yeah, the Richard Pryor Live on the Sunset Strip came out, and we went to the theater. I think we went to the theater several times to watch that thing over and over again. That I think that's when Bill started thinking this is what he wanted to be, and so that that had a huge influence on him. It was pretty cool when um, I actually got to speak to Richard Pryor right before he passed away. I mean, he could barely talk, and I was able to tell him because Bill Bill died before Richard Pryor, and I got to know his wife because. I forgot exactly what was going on. It had something to do with the drug war movie I was working on or something. I was going to interview him for the drug war film or something. And I was able to tell Richard uh, what a huge influence he was on Bill. And it made him smile. He was able to smile about it. So that, that was kind of neat. Uh, but so at that point, you know, Bill's still in high school. I mean, this is, you know, now we're in maybe 11th grade. We do this. Stratford Senior Follies, which was like the uh, talent show. We did all the high school talent shows. And um, I was driving Bill up to the comedy workshop like every Friday and Saturday nights. And for me, you know, I was up there drinking and, and flirting with girls and, you know, having a good time and watching my friend, you know, kick ass on stage. And he just kept getting better and better. And before you know it, um, there was only one comedian up there that could blow Bill away, and, and that was like the, obviously the monster presence of the whole place. That was Sam Kennison, and so it's a you know there's like a big long chapter with Sam Kennison and everybody, and it you know it's it's so weird for me to think back about my childhood and think about like staying up all night doing cocaine with Sam Kennison. It's just like a weird memory. Like I was. I have like foggy memories of living in a garage apartment and Sam Kennison like coming over my house at three in the morning and I don't know what the hell were we talking about I you know I guess women or something and and uh, but so back but back then Sam Kennison had a huge presence to the whole deal and he became kind of the mentor of everybody and he was also the guy that was gonna tell everybody we're gonna go to L A and we're gonna make it and we're getting out of Texas and we're gonna go make it big in show business and. Um, he became, you know, like the, the driving force back in that whole thing. And so around that point, I graduated from high school, uh, went to college and Bill kept doing comedy and, you know, and, but then, but then a bunch of big comedy clubs opened in Austin. So I was going to college in Austin, which is about a, it's about a two and a half, three hour drive from Houston. Um, so Bill was still living in Houston and I was living in Austin and, but he was, Coming up and staying in Austin all the time because a, a big new comedy club, uh, actually a comedy workshop in, in Austin opened and it was way bigger than the one in Houston. It actually probably a bigger, funner crowd too. I mean, the, the downtown, the, the one in Houston was kind of like a more hardcore nightclub place, but it was like a small, it was smaller. Um, and it's definitely, that was like the original stomping grounds and it had an improv place next door. Uh, but the one, the one in Austin opened up, that became like a really big deal. So all these, basically Austin kind of became like the new place where all the comedians were coming and suddenly, you know, Bill's basically coming in. We, we all rented a house together. So Bill would come up to stay in the house for weeks on end and, and perform there. And it was about that time 
uh, I bought, I started, I think I, I bought my first video camera in 1984, which was uh, a pretty big deal. You know what I mean? A video camera, a color video camera in 1984 was crazy. It was like thousands of dollars for the camera and thousands of dollars for the deck. Um, I think I had to break a few laws to get that thing. And so I, we got that thing. We started, we started trying to make movies with it. Of course, you know, we wanted to make a porno movie. We couldn't find any girls, so we ended up making a karate movie. We, it was the next best thing we could do. And we, we didn't really know karate, but we, uh, we, I, I enrolled in Taekwondo class and Bill had had some karate training, so we, we decided we were going to try to make a bad karate movie. And, and that's what we, we set out to do that. But also filming a lot of his, uh, concerts and recording his concerts. And, you know, so I, I was, you know, kind of trying to mix the whole music and comedy thing together all in one deal and, you know, combining it and, you know, the relationship just progressed like that. Well, I'm glad that you pulled that video camera because obviously it led to you maybe recording a lot of his shows, you know, same man, and obviously eventually kind of your own uh, producer kind of career in making documentaries. Uh, you mentioned earlier and then obviously you're at that ranch, and I, I can't help resist by asking the question. So obviously in the in the documentary, um, Bill Hicks, the story in, in 2009, it's mentioned kind of it's at the start of uh, Bill's kind of career. You mentioned just earlier that you know he wasn't into you know alcohol or drugs at that time, but you went out to this ranch and uh, and did magic mushrooms and kind of shared this uh, experience. Are you happy to talk about that? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's a little, it's a little more complicated than that. I mean, um, basically, um, it, 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 uh, Bill, what was funny is Bill had never tried alcohol in his life. And before, I'm pretty sure before he ever even tried alcohol, he took acid. So, before, you know, and for me, my, I, my brother became schizophrenic and, um, um, my parents and everybody always blamed his schizophrenia on the use of LSD and acid. So I was very afraid of hallucinogenics, right? And so it was crazy when all of a sudden here it is, my, my puritanical friend uh, who would never drink and never anything like that is going, let's take acid. And I'm like, are you freaking crazy that you, that you lose your mind? And, of course, if anybody could talk me into it, it was him. So I believe we probably took – acid and other things before we ever got to the mushrooms. I mean, and then once we found mushrooms, we realized how much better that was. And then this ranch uh, that uh, my family bought back in the early 70s that we still have today, it just became a place to come out here because we realized that when you're tripping, uh, like the beauty of coming to this ranch was that we could just come out here and completely let go of the outside world and know that no one's going to mess with us. You know what I mean? It's like no matter how hard you're tripping, um, it's, you know, even if a policeman came and pointed a gun at your head, you could go get off my land, you know? And so the ranch became this complete, you know, safety zone for us to come and uh, have all these experiences. And, and uh, you know, these experiences progressed over the years and, I think the probably the amounts of things and you know the the dosage of things and everything kind of uh, changed over the years, but ended up with you know uh, uh, doing mushrooms because of how much cleaner that was and and so yeah and and, and also it's called the name of the documentary was called uh, American the Bill Hicks Story. The one you're talking about, yeah, produced by uh, uh, Paul Thomas and Matt Harlock who are who are there in, in London. Yeah, yeah, it was a really good documentary. I guess, yeah, that's kind of the way they framed it. Uh, and they said, yeah, you basically kind of went out to, to the ranch, which, I mean, as someone in England, I can't even imagine uh, being able to go out to something like that. I guess maybe a farm would be the closest thing to that. But, yeah, they mentioned that you went out to, to the ranch. You obviously took these magic mushrooms, and you had kind of this shared experience uh, and kind of led to some of maybe Bill's thoughts about kind of you know, uh, all being one and kind of things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we did. There was uh, uh, the one time that really s stuck out was a thing called the Harmonic Convergence. It was one of these new agey kind of things. I believe it was September of 89 where 
all the new age people from all over were saying there's going to be this big mind melt of people. So people all over the world were going to sacred places. We have a place here called Enchanted Rock. A bunch of people went to that. A lot of people were like went to the top of Mount Shasta. And it was supposed to be some sort of an alignment of the universe where everybody all at once was going to meditate and everybody was going to tap into um, uh, one kind of specific conscious all at once. And so we we came out here to the ranch and took a bunch of mushrooms and, and tapped into it. It was just, yeah, it was incredible. And we had, the, you know, um, what felt like a UFO experience. And, you know, yeah, it was, yeah, an incredible time. I mean, it's, it's weird because when things like that happen to you, it's – uh, and I'm not, it, you know, and, and it is real. It was real. It really happened. But as the years go on and people ask you about it, it's just, it becomes weirder and weirder where, you know, because after Bill died, people would be like, tell me about the spaceship, Kevin. And I'd be like, it's like, uh, you know, it just became kind of like a little bit of a gimmick a little bit to where I was, you know, and we, I did a book and I go, look, I'm going to, I'm going to put all the spaceship stories in one thing. And, you know, and not that I don't believe in extraterrestrial life. I believe in all this stuff, but it just, it just became a little bit of a gimmick when, after Bill died, where everybody was like, talk about the spaceship, talk about the spaceship. And, and even when they made the movie, they were like pushing really hard up. But I, I love those guys. I'm actually, uh, still really good friends with Paul Thomas. He just sent me this t-shirt. Paul Thomas, who made the Bill Hicks documentary, he's, uh, been filming a new documentary in, in Ukraine right now about architects rebuilding the buildings that are getting blown up. He just sent me this. And, um, so, but yeah, I mean, even, even when they're shooting the documentary, it was like, okay, we got to like recreate this UFO experience. And it's just kind of one of those, you had to be there type of things, but you know, it was definitely, uh, you know, it, it was definitely as real as it gets. That's all I can say. Yeah, fair enough. I can, I can imagine how it happened. I, I won't push you on that too more, just because I literally kind of rewatched the documentary. Uh, but now I guess you give me the backstory. I, I can kind of understand that. So again, kind of before we get to you know your documentaries and kind of some of the early ones you did. Obviously, Bill Hicks' kind of career uh, evolved over the years. With as you said, you know he's completely sober and he was kind of more of a clean cut kind of uh, medium. Uh, am I correct? Again, I'm kind of going off the documentary here. Uh, that after, you know, he started kind of using drugs and alcohol, he kind of let loose a bit more. But then again, the next kind of step of evolution, you know, when he got sober, his comedy kind of got to his peak and better. And he kind of went to, you know, the UK, uh, Australia, where he kind of had um, a better time with, with the audience. Um, I guess you're happy to kind of unpack that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, in those, First years, I think Bill went sober around 89. I remember we did, um, the, uh, the, the video that I made was called Sane Man. It was on Netflix for many years and it's, it's been out now. I think it's in, out on a thing called Comedy Dynamics. Um, he, uh, he, he went sober about six months before we shot that and that's when everything changed. So back, you know, it, it, it was back in the day, you know, Using tons of drugs was like a normal thing. And you think back to those days about how reckless and crazy everybody was, you know, how everybody was like risking their lives with the amount of drugs and things we would mix with cocaine and, and, and downers and alcohol and just like, it's a, it's a miracle we lived through all that. But I guess, I guess they have fentanyl these days. So I guess it's worse now, you know, I, mean, I guess things have gotten even stronger, but Back then, it was kind of hard. When Bill was drinking like that, it was really kind of hard to get anything done. Like, we had a million things going on, but it was really hard to get anything done. So when he went sober and I went and saw him performing for the first time after he, – he disappeared for a little while from me. And I think he I think he went to either L.A. or New York. And he came back and he's like, you got to see me. You know, I've, I haven't had a drink in a couple of months. You got to see me. I went to go see him and it was like, oh my God. It was like, it was like watching the bill that I always knew was there. I mean, it wasn't like anything new, but it was, it was seeing him completely focused and also, uh, with the endurance, you know, the, the new, the thing that him going sober gave him like the endurance. Like before there was such a long, so many years of him, 
going on stage and it would be great, it'd be great. And then, and then it became a thing where everybody in the audience would be sending drinks up to him. And that became part of his whole gimmick was that he would, he would literally drink anything that anybody sent up to the stage. So usually by the end of every show, you know, it was, it was a disaster, right? And, um, uh, so when that quit, suddenly Bill, who was like this, always there, uh, became just laser focused and, and had this incredible endurance. He could go up there and like just nail it show after show with just hardcore consistency. And that's when I said like, well, we gotta, you know, it's time to make a, like a, a feature length deal because the only, it was always frustrating when we were younger because Bill did these Letterman appearances when he, when we were really young and he would go on Letterman and you'd be like, God, that's just, like, that's just not, that's just not it. It's really weird. Like, they would put him through the sensor machine and he would go up there and he would be watching his P's and Q's. And, and I remember all my friends and family would be like, yeah, I don't know, Kevin, your friends, you know, he's okay. I don't really get what you see in him that much. I'm like, no, you gotta, you gotta, like, come to one of his shows. You don't get it. You don't get it. And I remember the one time, I finally dragged my parents out to see one of his shows because my parents used to accuse me of wasting my life on this guy. You know, why are you putting so much time and energy into this guy? You know, like, wh- like, what are you doing? And, and I was like, no, he's going to be this amazing comedian and we're working on all these things together. And, and of course, the one time I dragged my parents out to a show, Bill, like, gets so freaking wasted and it was just a disaster. And, and, um, and it was just like, uh, and, and so, um, you know, I was also dealing with like my family and friends always telling me that Bill was this bad influence on me. So when he went sober, it was like a light bulb went off and it was like off to the races. And that's why, you know, it was just ironic and kind of ultimate tragic about how, you know, I guess from the time he went sober to the time he died was probably around four and a half years or maybe, maybe five years. Uh, so it was like something in him, something in him or some spirit guide or something must have said, you've only got so much time left. You got to like get this material out of your system because you're out of here. So, you know, I, you know, who knows, who knows, but it just seemed like once he went sober, he became this man on a mission. And, and I, I loved it because he was all about working. You know, I, I was never like the guy wanting, I mean, I, I would hang out, but I always enjoyed working more than hanging out. My idea of, Hanging out would be in a, in a recording studio, like working on music. That's, that was my idea of having fun hanging out, not just sitting around drinking, doing nothing, playing cards or, or whatever. So when Bill became a workaholic, uh, that's, you know, definitely my, probably my most enjoyable memories of our whole, you know, friendship, like being in a studio and working long hours and just staying focused and, um, and it was a little tricky because I, you know, I still kept drinking a little bit, you know, but Bill never laid that into me. But I, you know, like I, you know, I, I drink a couple of beers at night. You know, I'm not, I wasn't drinking the, the bottle of whiskey and, but it, you know, but it was cool because Bill, Bill never laid the AA trip on me. He was, he was good about that. And, you know, we respected it and he kept smoking his cigarettes. And, but, uh, but yeah, there was definitely a change. And then, and then years later when, he went to England and, uh, and I guess first he did this, uh, thing in Montreal that was a big breakthrough for him. I didn't see that. And he went to England and I remember for the first time seeing, uh, a recording of one of his British performances where I was like, Oh my God, you know, it was like, you finally made it. You know, it was like, Bill finally made it. You know, it's like, he's finally getting recognized. And then after all that huge audiences, huge audiences, he comes back. To America, and he's like, we're gonna go record an album, and we go to we go to San Francisco, and it's this tiny little club with, you know, half of the audience doesn't even know who he is, the other half doesn't care, and maybe there's a handful of people that do know who he is, and you know, it's like tourists walking, you know, it was just like, God, I could just see like how crazy and frustrating, but but to be honest with you, sometimes my my favorite performances of Bill to go back and listen to are not the ones where he was in front of an adoring audience. But my favorite performances of Bill are the ones where he's duking it out in front of a bunch of assholes. You know, those are my favorite performances because he's up there like Mike Tyson. Like he's he's up there like 
you know, jabbing and, 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 and throwing hooks and, and, uh, that, those are by far still my favorite performances, the ones where it's not the adoring audience. Yeah, when, when he was performing kind of those tiny kind of, you know, clubs in America where there's, you know, 20 kind of people rather than a massive crowd, um, you know, did he kind of placate at all to the audience or did he just kind of, kind of like you said, just kind of let rip and he wouldn't really care who's there, you know, he's going to say his ideas and what kind of he wants? Well, I think, you know, yeah, all of that, but I think he would also trigger off, you know, if it was almost like a gift if someone tried to heckle them or screw with them a little bit. It was like, you know, when, when someone would try to heckle Bill, and it's just like other people, you know, watching someone try to heckle Joe Rogan or someone trying to heckle Sam Kennis, and it was like, yeah, you know, it's like, here we go. This is where it gets fun. And so, um, you know, I think he just became fearless. I think, I think being adored in England gave him the confidence to come back to America and not give a damn what some little tiny audience of idiots thinks or, or to care what, you know, the censors that David Letterman thought or, you know, or any of the other TV people, because he, he knew what he was doing was working and he knew it was real. And, and so it gave him the confidence to just finally be himself um, and just go for it. But, and, and he was, he was going for it before, but it was different once he got sober and once he got the confidence. Then he was in there, you know, he became, you know, I guess the difference is he became like the big headliner kind of guy, you know, back because back in the days, you know, there was a lot of years where he was just kind of like the middle act guy. He wasn't like the big, the big finale closer. Yeah, so obviously I only know him from on stage and obviously what I've seen. So kind of what, what was he like as a friend, you know, behind the scenes was kind of what you saw on the stage, him obviously probably in a more kind of exaggerated uh, kind of manner. So what what was he like, like as a friend and, and behind the scenes? Uh, Bill was just, he was like a really sweet, loyal, cool person. I mean, he wasn't doing his routine and, and it's always, it's always tricky because I know, you know, it's even like having friends like Alex Jones and other people where people are like, is that really what he's like? And then when you go, no, that's not what he's like, then people respond by saying, oh, so that was just an act. No, it wasn't just an act. It was, it, that's just kind of like a, I don't know how to say it, but that's just his on stage public persona. Like he's always like who he was, but you know, he was, a, you know, a, very quiet, well-mannered, actually kind of shy at times, uh, hum, super humble, loyal uh, person, you know, always picking up the check at dinner, always making sure, you know, his friends, like, were okay. He was really good about always checking in on people. So he was just a really kind, loyal, good person. He wasn't, like, some big bombastic, you know, asshole, you know, and so... uh um, after he died, people, you know, would always be like, oh, so was he, was that what he was like? They would watch him screaming on stage. He goes, so that's what he was like when you guys hung out? I'm like, no, he wasn't. Why would he be screaming while we're hanging out? You know, <laughs> he's on stage. So, uh, it's a little, it's hard to explain. It's like you're, uh, it's like you'd be talking about something. As friends, and then he had the ability to go on stage and turn it into a routine uh, that would mean something to audiences, whether it was like we're talking about like abortion or we're talking about the war in Iraq or just whatever. He would, you know, you're joking about stuff as friends, like regular friends do, but then he would go on stage and do a routine from it, and, and I could recognize like all the notes from our conversation but he had put it like kind of a different perspective or twist on it that now made it work for a general audience. And it wasn't like an inside joke because that's like a big difference. I think a lot of people, you know, they have like that funny friend, but they don't realize that when they go on stage, it doesn't work anymore because it's all like one big inside joke. And so I think Bill had the ability of having that inside joke, but then being able to like make it work in front of people that weren't in necessarily in on the inside joke. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're going on stage, 
you know, you have to kind of increase the energy a bit for the audience. You're obviously going to be, you know, different to kind of when you're with your friends, but, you know, the ideas, the kind of character of yourself is pro- probably there in your personal life. So kind of to segue to kind of the, the, the next conversation, obviously Bill was quite ahead of his time in some of the stuff he said, but, you know, about the Gulf War uh, and the drug war. And obviously, you've created documentaries since, and as I said, uh, well worth the watch. I recommend both of them. I'll put them up on the screen and put them in the show notes. Obviously, one of them was in 2006, and then the other was in 2013. So, now, well, the what, what, one, yeah, the first one I think was released on Showtime in 2008. Uh, so, I mean, I think I probably entered my first film festival in 2006, but I was still tinkering with it in 2007. Still doing film festivals in 2007, then I assigned my Showtime in 2008. Um, and then from there, I guess it went on to Netflix and Hulu and other things and Amazon. And and then the next one, uh, How We'd Won the West, then came out in 2010. And then the American Drug War II came out in 2013. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Bill, look, I mean, uh, uh, Bill was a huge influence on that because he was really like uh, talking a lot about legalization of marijuana. And the funny part about that was that Bill was not a pot smoker at all. Bill never really liked marijuana. Uh, and people always just assumed that he did because he would talk about how it needs to be legalized. He used to have so many great bits about legalizing marijuana. But Bill, Bill, some people's chemistry does not mix with marijuana. Bill was one of those people. Like he, you would, Give him some really strong weed, and he would like be standing in corner, it, it, like like talking to himself, saying, "I'm in hell." Like, I, you know, I can't. This is not for me. And so, you know, he it's just one of those things where he he understood the benefits of it, even though it didn't really benefit him or, or work for him. But I think a lot of that had to do with that, a lot to do with my my brother, who did a lot of drugs and um, ended up passing away from a seizure. Uh, and all the things I've been through a childhood, as a childhood, childhood thing with, with, with all that. And then, uh, there was a documentary out. Right now I can't remember the name of it, but it was a marijuana documentary. It was the first time, like, somebody ever, like, covered, um, uh, the topic of marijuana really well. And, uh, I'll remember it here in a second. It, it was just something, it had the word marijuana. It, it, and, uh, uh, and when I saw that, I said, well, somebody needs to make this movie, but about all drugs. Like somebody needs to do this movie and not just talk about marijuana, but talk about all drugs because it's not a matter of like being for or against drugs. It's, this is really about do people belong in prison because they're doing these things, right? I mean, you know, and if I want to like experiment with something dangerous, uh, I pre- you know, we appreciate the warnings. But I don't necessarily believe that I belong in jail because I, you know, or, or if I have an addiction, do I belong in jail? And I think that that kind of became the slant of it. So I wanted to do a, um, a movie that kind of covered all the topics, not just marijuana, but covered cocaine, covered crystal meth. Back in the days, early days, we used to call that crank. It was not called crystal meth back then. It was, it was a thing called crank that bikers had. And it was brown. Um, I wanted to talk about hallucinogenics and uh, ecstasy and, you know, and, and uh, just talk about private prisons, get into the whole private prison industrial complex and how the people are profiting from putting people in prison. And I thought, you know, if I could just get all that into one single documentary, uh, you know, maybe that could that could be pretty good. I spent I probably spent four years on it. Yeah, well, I think you did a really good job. As you said, you, you go through the different drugs, but then you look at the, the different angles, which I kind of like to get your thoughts on soon. So you obviously mentioned the private prisons. You obviously mentioned around Contra with, you know, the Contras, all of the North and Freeway Ricky Ross, which obviously featured in the documentary. So kind of, yeah, so I think when you speak to most people, they... Uh, again, we're coming from different cultures, UK, US, I'm obviously 22, a lot long, uh, younger than you. But I think if you speak to a lot of people probably in this generation, and even my parents who, you know, kind of lived through it, I think most people don't necessarily think that people should go to prison for it. 
However, they're kind of just willing to turn a blind eye to the fact that they do and that it is illegal. They're not necessarily against people doing it, but they don't, don't really care too much about the laws. Same with, you know, the whole war on terror. It's kind of far away. If you don't do it, it's kind of not your problem. Probably similar to someone in America who's, you know, doesn't have guns would be pretty easy for them just to say guns be, can be illegal because it doesn't affect them. So kind of what are your thoughts on, on Scatchy kind of going forward? So since, since, the, since you created your documentary, have you seen kind of people's minds change in the last 10, 15 years? Not just about weed, but kind of drug legalization as a concept. But have you seen much change since you first created these documentaries? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there has been a change. I mean, you know, I like to think maybe my, my film made a little difference, but definitely, definitely in the marijuana thing, because I was, um, kind of got really caught up in the whole Los Angeles West Coast legalization. And even though Colorado legalized marijuana first, uh, it really all started in California. And so it was fun. I was, I was there at ground zero. Uh, and, and so, you know, you talk about me going from all these crazy things to crazy things. Well, I, I, I got to know a lot of people in the marijuana thing that you probably, you know, wouldn't know who they were. Um, but that had a lot to do with legalizing marijuana, people that sacrificed their lives to, to legalize it. So that became a really crazy fun time too, being a part of like this whole movement there in California. And you also brought up Freeway Ricky Ross. That, that ended up being like a really funny story. You know, I helped Freeway Rick. A lot of people, basically known as the guy that started the crack epidemic in Los Angeles, um, getting his cocaine from the CIA, ended up becoming really good friends with Ricky, uh, helped him get out of prison. After the film came out, you know, I, I helped him get out of prison, and we were parlaying that into a reality show. Of course, we got a deal to do some reality show. I find myself like, oh, my God, you wouldn't believe through all the trials and tribulations I went through trying to get that thing going. Um it ultimately got passed on from other stuff. It's a tricky world out there, reality TV. Um, but so, you know, you just, you meet these people that are, I don't know, it, it, it's just hard to explain. And you go, well, as long as the people just selling it are the ones going to jail, I mean, it gets, it gets tricky. I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky, but I think things have changed. I mean, I think one of the, the weird, unfortunate deals now is this, um, this uh, opioid epidemic, but one of the the strange things that when I moved back to, to Texas here, because uh, California was very open, was that I had to have oral surgery on a broken bone I had in my jaw from a childhood motocross accident, and uh, they wouldn't even give me like Tylenol three because of the opioid epidemic, and I and I'm like. I'm an old man who just had surgery. What is some kid in Alabama doing fentanyl? Like, what does that have to do with anything? And so it's a, this fentanyl crisis, you know, it's, it's a, it's a weird thing how it's all been slushed into this one whole deal. And I think where you got the, the whole story of the Sackler family, um, which is like a fascinating story too. And that, that kind of gels to it, all the profiting and, and addiction, but. You know, uh, but once again, I mean, the pharmaceutical companies can get away with drugging and killing millions and millions and millions of people. Uh, and if you can just compare the stats uh, to how many people die from all illegal drugs combined every year versus how many people die from prescription drugs every year, it's it's mind boggling. Although fentanyl now is like has kind of changed that, you know, they finally they finally went too far. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's like, I heard some comedian joke and it was the funniest day the other day where it was, you know, talking about guy when I was young, like heroin was doing heroin was a big deal. Now it's like these kids today are like, Oh yeah, I could, I just did, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't get any fentanyl. So I just did. So all I got is heroin. Like as though that's just like nothing. I mean, the fentanyl is so strong. And so where, you know, where does this all end? And, you know, and so it's sad that, um, you know, Chinese pharmaceutical companies and Mexican labs and all these things are going to come and someone's always got to come wreck the party, right, for a profit. So, but, you know, who knows where they're all going to go? Who knows? But, but now, 
But now, Mar- like now, it's like nobody even cares about marijuana. When I first moved to Texas, everybody was like, "Oh, marijuana, marijuana." But and now it's like it's it not. It, even though it's not legal here, the CBD thing kind of like blew everything out in a weird way to where like nobody really even it cares anymore. It's it's just become so. And so all the it's just funny to think that all the years of of like the the politicians and, and and everybody thinking like, oh, if we legalize it, everyone's going to do it. Everyone's going to do it. It's just like, no, quite the opposite. Now that it's legal, nobody really, it's just, nobody really cares about it anymore. And I was in LA during this period of time where all these companies were going to, you know, they're all trying to be these marijuana startup companies where, you know, we all these people branding marijuana with these specific brand names and these strains that they own the copyrights and trademarks to and the and like chemical formulations to all these things and the vape pens and all these companies are coming out and really for the most of it, most of them have kind of failed because it's just become this thing now where it's just you can buy C B D at Walmart for God's sakes. You know what I mean? It's like the day that you can buy C B D at Walmart, it's like it, it's over. No one cares anymore. It just, it's, you know, and so it's, uh, it's just interesting to see how, how marijuana kind of turned out to be exactly what everybody in the marijuana movement said it would be from day one. But then all these greedy people rushed in trying to make it into this other thing. And it just, for some reason, marijuana was the one thing that could not be corrupted. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, it's still illegal, but I mean, most probably people kind of tolerate it. I mean, obviously, people still get arrested for it, but maybe in the general population, it's tolerated. But I mean, compared to America, there's basically like there's like zero conversation about legalizing weed. Like, it is never really spoken about on the news or politicians asked about it. It's just a non-issue, which is pretty strange. But kind of going back to what you said, and I'd love to get your thoughts on Freeway Ricky Ross, Gary Webb, all of that later. But the, the segment of your documentary, um, The American Drug War, The Last White Hope, I thought was really interesting about the private prisons and, and, and Tark uh, and and the prison in Arizona. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, you sure, featured sure. in it. Jeff sure, Jorah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, he's gone now. Yeah, I think I've seen him. A, yeah, I think I've seen him in another documentary as well because he's got like a, a framed picture of Harry Anslinger, kind of one of the original people in the drug war. So yeah, so sometimes for people they find it hard to understand. That guy, that guy was playing a, a part. You know what I mean? He 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 saw like a character that he could play and make himself famous, and and he did. He he played that character well. I mean he. It was really funny to go to the prison there and all these kids sitting in like a prison camp would ask for his autograph. It was the most crazy. Underneath the seat of my car was 11 cents worth of, of methamphetamine and they, they convicted me of that. In Phoenix, Arizona, a single man has created a kingdom from fighting meth and other illegal drugs. With four landslide victories under his belt, very few sheriffs have enjoyed the job security of Sheriff Joe Arpaio. What is this, a documentary on drugs? You either love him or hate him. And in Phoenix, if you hate him, you keep it to yourself. Don't touch that, or you'll get this electric, you'll die. Oh, okay. We don't screw around here. This isn't Texas. (laughs) All right. The reason I'm the toughest, because see these guys, right? Yep. Pink, where's your pink underwear? I got him. So see him. How come they're fading? They, they don't got no new ones for me. I asked Mr. Apollo, they just don't got them. Can we just start with you just like telling me your name and who you are? I gotta tell you in front of these guys, they don't know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Arpaio, Maricopa County, Arizona, sure. It. I This is the largest tent city in, in the United States, probably in the world. I would almost bet half of these guys are here for drugs. You see this? 
they can only mail postcards, did away with their envelopes, and on the postcard, that's me, we put the uh, inmates in the, I mean the dogs in the air-conditioned jail, and these guys are in the hot tents. It says that while inmates live in a hot desert tent city, rescue dogs live in air-conditioning comfort, right? Let me sign this. Everywhere I go, I sign these things for these guys. I spent uh, 32 years fighting drugs around the world. I was a director in Mexico, South America, had offices in Panama, worked with General Noriega, had offices in Argentina. I was the only federal agent in the Middle East. Now we have armies out there. My job in uh, Turkey, I lived in Turkey, was to stop the French connection. And we did stop the French connection when I was a director in Mexico. We arrested the top guy in uh, Asuncion. Although he and his men still arrest people for crack, a newer drug has long since taken the lead. We have a big methamphetamine problem right here. You can't blame Mexico for methamphetamine when we see 50 laboratories right here in this county. What is it about crystal meth? Yeah. Methamphetamine is easily made. You can make it anywhere in a motel room, in a car. That's one reason. Methamphetamines, I mean, it's all chemicals, you know, and, it, and it's, it's the one that it's the epidemic of of Arizona, I know that for sure, of Phoenix and Mesa, Tempe, Chandler, all the surrounding areas, I know it's an epidemic here. You guys are like here, like with chains around your legs and you're wanting his autograph, it's like just crazy. He, but he, he, he created that, uh, that persona and um, I actually became, it's weird, I think after that happened too, I think I was pitching some other show with him and I, you know, I, I, I've become friends with some of the most awful people. <laughs> I don't really yeah. know what I remember him. <laughs> yeah, he, he was a strange guy. He kind of made like the prison people wear like pink underneath, and he was like, "You can only send postcards back to your family, and it's a picture of like dogs in air conditioning, you know, getting their condition air conditioning nice and cold, while they're yeah. staying like in the desert in tents, and it's just like all these people are, like laughing, and like you said, it was pretty strange to see." I don't know if it was because, you know, you're filming a documentary and they're kind of finding it funny, but, like, they're treating this guy pretty well, considering, like, he's like, literally kind of... Yeah, they, yeah they, the prisoners would treat him like a rock star. It was, uh, like, a kind of a weird psychology to see the people that are being abused so horribly, like, kissing up to him in such a way. It was, it was really, really fascinating. Yeah, so can you just kind of break down for people? So it's kind of when you do speak to people about drugs being illegal or legal, kind of the point that you come up against is, you know, why would the government keep it illegal? You know, if it shouldn't be, you know, they, they could be making money off it. They must really kind of believe in it. So what's kind of the incentives people don't see about the private prisons? More in America, we have them in the UK. It's a much smaller industry. Uh, than America. So can you kind of talk people through the whole private prison industry and, you know, some of the examples like how to kind of fund the whole town and, you know, bring employment? Uh, yeah, I think that was Correction Corporations of America. Well, I mean, look, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a corporation like any other corporation. So I believe it was publicly traded, uh, on the NASDAQ, um, or the Dow, I'm not sure which one. Probably, I don't know, or you can check it out. Um, CC, uh, Whatever, you can look it up. Um, and uh, basically, it just came down to simple math. The more people they had in beds, the higher the stock value. Like, what Like what else do you need to know other than the more people we can get into this damn place, the more money we're going to make. And they make a lot of money. And so the drug war just became the perfect way of filling all those beds. It's, like, just perfect, right? It's just same with how there was one set of laws for regular cocaine and another set of laws for crack cocaine. I mean, how, do, how does that make any sense where if I took a bag of pure cocaine and then add baking soda to it and now sell it to you in a much more diluted form that it's way more illegal? Like, does that make any sense? I mean, there's no laws against baking soda. There's no laws against cooking things. And so 
Yeah, crack is horrible. I've ever, I've never, the people that I've ever been around that smoked crack, uh, um, this old, uh, gangster guy I used to be friends with is T. Rogers. He just recently passed away. It's weird when you do these kind of movies, slowly you watch everybody in the damn movie die. You know, it's kind of, and this is kind of one of the, the weird things, all these relationships I made over the years and, uh, a really good friend, sweet man, T. Rogers. He was actually the, the guy who founded the Bloods in Los Angeles. Um, I went through a period and we almost adopted his grandson for a while. I mean, we got really close to him. He put it really well. He said, when people smoke crack, it's like ringing a bell. Like you would smoke crack cocaine and it would like ring a bell on your brain. And then you could never, you could never get that back. And then people would chase the rest, spend the rest of their lives trying to get that back. But the point I'm trying to get at is that they created a thing where smoking crack became a thing that black people did. And, and that's, you know, one of the interesting topics that I always found interesting, I never really got to delve into, and I even thought about this could be interesting for another drug war documentary, is why why did crack become so popular with black people and and crystal meth was more of like a white people thing? And, and not even looking at the, the economics of it so much, but almost more about like the high that it creates and kind of just what it, what it like taps into. And um, there's like, there's more to it than just like, you know, what neighborhood you live into, like why certain people are attracted to certain drugs and all that. But they purposely created a, a law around a drug that black people were highly attracted to and that black people poor black people could get a hold of because that was the difference too. I mean, when a white guy went out and bought cocaine, it was like a hundred dollars for a gram basically, but you could go buy a $5 rock uh, or $10 rock out on the streets. Well, suddenly, you know, here's something that all these broke people could be doing because <clears throat> they could go out and get a $5 rock, a $10 rock, and it would make them feel like a million bucks for like 20 minutes or something like that. But now there's a law in place that makes that something like 20 times more illegal than if they had like a gram of cocaine, having like this little speck of cocaine mixed with stuff. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and that was a Reagan, that was a Reagan type deal um, where they, they purposely set out to imprison, you know, a very specific part of the population. And these were people that were just easy targets. Like you, you take poor people off the streets and you throw them in a prison. Well, there's no one's coming for them. You know what I mean? There, there's not going to be some badass lawyer coming to get them out there. They're screwed. That's it. Now they, they just become property of the state, you know, and then you find cases where they're, they're making these guys like build things, build widgets and things like in jails and, and, uh, and, and when you're in jail, you have to have family sending you money and making a, a one minute phone call costs $10. You know, buying a pack of cigarettes is $10. Buying a Coca Cola is $5. You know, and, you know, and it's just all, it's a huge industry that, that they're able to, to prey on poor people. And so if you want to just get a bunch of poor people locked into a thing and make a bunch of money off poor people, well, Hey, like, let's just, let's just make crack illegal and crystal meth illegal and we'll, we'll get this place packed in no time. And it worked. Yeah. You're referring to, it was originally the hundred to one ratio when it came in from Reagan. I think it was like 1986. Yeah. Uh, which basically, and if you had five grams of crack, it was the equivalent of having 500 grams of cocaine. But I think under Obama, they might have changed it to, to a lot lower. Um, but yeah, you kind of mentioned there that, you know, black people tended to use crack more and they, you know, could have targeted them. Do you think there was anything in, in kind of Nixon's mind? I know the drug war kind of started before Nixon, you know, with heroin back in the day with Harry Ann Slanger uh, and things like that. But Nixon kind of, you know, truly kind of extended the drug war. Do you think there was anything in Nixon's mind that, you know, all the kind of the, the hippies in the, in the 60s and 70s kind of opposing the Vietnam War and stuff had something in common that they tended to use drugs? So when he brings in, you know, Class A, or sorry, Schedule 1 in America, you know, you have weed, all these psychedelic drugs, 
do you think that was kind of targeting those people as a way to kind of prevent them uh, or minimizing the amount of people protesting kind of the foreign policy of the U.S.? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's been proven. I mean, I think, I mean, there's, I believe there's like recordings of Nixon basically <laughs> saying all the things that you just said. Yeah, there's no, there's no secret to it. There's no conspiracy there. Anybody that like him and anybody that was uh, against his policy of keeping Vietnam going, you know, for sure. And, you know, so this is, this is long before crack cocaine, but you know, they, you know, back then just making marijuana so illegal. I mean, back then, I mean, people could go to prison for a long time for having a joint. I mean, that, that, that's real. I mean, and, um, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. He, he basically said he created this drug war to basically take all of his, uh, critics off the street and, um, put them in, put them inside of a building and, and profit off of them. Sounds like a pretty good plan when you think about it. Yeah, 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 and again, obviously, you referred to the private prisons, the cheap labor. So I kind of, I actually spoke to Scott Horton uh, on Friday. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He kind of runs antiwar.com, uh, and he's kind of, kind of the guy for that. And uh, we was kind of speaking about uh, like the scheduling of, uh, no, sorry, private prisons, sorry, where they literally earn from like 15. 30 cents an hour and they do obviously all this labor and obviously again the private prison makes money for them being there and then also uses them for cheap labor obviously you kind of had people in, in your documentary implying or kind of straight up saying you know in a way it's obviously a form of slavery it's you know it's just completely below the minimum wage you know whether in your, you're in prison or not you're still kind of contributing labor to someone while they make money off you so it, Pretty insane there. But um, I kind of like, yeah, get your thoughts on Freeway Ricky Ross, kind of the story there. You know, I don't know how much in depth you know about kind of Iran Contra uh, and Gary Webb. But what, am I correct that while you was creating the documentary, uh, there was kind of you put where you were speaking to uh, Freeway Ricky Ross on the phone where you told him that Gary Webb had died. Was that going on at the same time where he? Yeah, where well, he, I was. You know, he, I, yeah, I mean, I was scheduled to uh, interview Gary Webb. In fact, I had just finished reading all his books, and and um, he was one of the people uh, uh, that I was getting ready to go film. And um, and at the same time, I was talking to Ricky all the time. I got to where I was uh, helping Ricky in prison with, you know, like like everybody does when they know someone in prison, constantly sending him money. So. Just to finish your one idea when you said it's a type of slavery, well, I mean, it is slavery. When you, when you pay someone 30, 30 cents an hour and then you charge them 50 cents for a Coke, I mean, you charge $5 for a Coke or $10 for a minute long phone call, that's the same as slavery. You know, it's the same. So, but, uh, yeah, no, Freeway Ricky Ross, I mean, he, he, uh, he just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I mean, you could say that on one level, and then he happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Not, not to follow, but he, he was just this really enigmatic, totally unviolent. He was a Crips guy from the streets, kind of from the Crips neighborhood, but he was never a gangbanger. And he just was this, Kind of like the Peter Pan. I mean, people just love the little. He's a little guy, the sweetest guy in the world. People just love this guy. He flocked around this guy. He just had an energy of, of doing stuff. And so, this guy just created huge entourages of people around him, and he was able to just create an army around him to do this deal. And then, and then this guy he was getting his cocaine from uh, ended up having this connection. That ended up being connected back to financing, you know, the the war, and you know, it's a crazy story. So, from Rick's perspective, he was getting this super high-end, pure cocaine, steady stream, great price. Probably even getting it fronted to him. I mean, you know, it was, you know, you could get kilos, about a hundred pound, almost a hundred pounds a day, fronted to him. And he was able to, you know, turn that around and get it out on the streets, you know, on a daily basis to the tune of a million dollars a day um, for for a while, sustain that. And then to find out that that had been a, a CIA connection, 
You know, when you find out like your drug dealers in the CIA, you got to be like, uh oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I better get some plastic surgery and change my name and go live on the North Pole because this ain't, this ain't going to end well, you know? And, uh, you know, sure enough, they set him up and they got him. Like, they, you know, they locked him in a hole for, for 20 years. And uh, just because of where I was at the time and getting involved with his lawyers and all that, you know, I, I tried to help to get him out. And, uh, you know, we had to, Show the judge that he, he was a changed man. We had to show the judge that we had a reality show TV thing for him and he was going to help kid, keep kids off the streets. And, uh, it was just an interesting guy. I mean, I think Ricky would be successful at anything he put his hands to. And he's put his hands to a million things. Now he's promoting fighters and he's got, you know, he's got in a million directions. I mean, there's, there's a point in time where Ricky got out of jail. He, he had, he had so many different companies going. He had like the freeway Ricky Ross. Wig factory, the Freeway Ricky Ross muffler company, and the Freeway Ricky Ross daycare center. And the Freeway, I mean, it just went on and on and on and on. All the different Freeway Ricky Ross things that, uh, you know, how could you not love him? He was awesome. Or he is awesome. I still, I, I, I spoke to him not that long ago. We stay in touch. I think he's still working yeah. on a radio show. Yeah. I mean, it comes across as, you know, a pretty nice guy on the phone, considering obviously most people would see him as kind of, you know, the scum of the earth, sold crack cocaine, you know, around, but when you kind of hear him, you know, limited it is in the documentary, he does kind of come across as a, a pretty kind of nice guy who, you know, like many people kind of in the drug war, get caught up, they're, they're in poverty, they're poor, maybe their parents went to prison for, you know, drug crimes, and the best way to make money is selling drugs, which is obviously one of the, the problems with the drug war is that it incentivizes uh, people in poverty, you know, the cartels. I mean, if, if you actually, went, you know, you kind of speak about it in the documentary, I can't remember his name, where he says, you know, the three kind of groups who want drugs to be illegal the most are, you know, the, the prisons, the police, you know, the DEA, the agencies, and then the cartels. Cause well, yeah, the alcohol. <laughs> Alcohol companies and pharmaceutical companies, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's tricky. I mean, look, I mean, they people get addicted to the most addictive thing on earth. That's the money, you know. I mean, it's, you know, you take a kid off the street and suddenly he's making this crazy money. He's not going to quit, right? I, you know, there, no one's going to walk away from making, like, crazy money like that, you know, and the, and the hole just gets deeper and deeper, and I always... And I always thought, like, too, just from a quality standpoint where, you know, if you take cocaine, for example, I always thought, like, well, why can't we just chew a coca leaf? Like, why, why, why wouldn't it be legal to just buy coca leaves and chew on it, you know? Um, like, people do, uh, if, I guess if you go to Peru and other places like that, they're, they're allowed to put it in their tea and they're allowed to, like, experience like the whatever that is so i'm sure it's a, kind of like a caffeine kind of you know thing but no instead everybody in america is doing this thing that's made from gasoline and kerosene and you see you see the process that they make cocaine it's just it's horrifying you know i mean it's people are putting diesel fuel into their bodies the same with crystal meth i mean they're practically putting drano in their bodies it's horrifying so it, it, it's tricky. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you just legalized everything, what would happen to society? Yes, I understand that. But I think the way that they've handled it is basically it's all just profit incentivized. You know, it, everybody's just trying to protect their profit. No one's really trying to save society. I mean, hell, it's, uh, people are trying to save society. It wouldn't be a hundred, it wouldn't be a thousand degrees outside right now. I would it? Nobody cares. We're all just going to melt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of the other side of it is when I was kind of a bit younger, I was thought, why wouldn't they want it to be legal? Because they could, you know, make loads of money off it, tax, just like they do with tobacco and alcohol. And I guess that's kind of the other side of it is the existing incentives for the pharmaceutical companies, for the private prisons. And also, you know, the DEA <laughs> wouldn't really exist as an agency if yeah. there was no such thing as the drug war. They wouldn't have that budget in the police. Wouldn't have, I mean, again, I was kind of saying to Scott Holton last week, 
if there was no drug war, thousands and thousands of police would lose their jobs because you just wouldn't need it as many because there's no drug users uh, for them to arrest. Organized crime would have to shrink down. You know, they can still sell guns and whatever other illegal stuff they do, but their kind of money mainly comes from, from drugs that are so easy and it has to find them off. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I became good friends with a guy named uh, Sally Castillo, who's a former DA agent who's in the film, and he's a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, you, you know, I, I, the feeling where these people would be, the people that aren't evil, that, that you know, they, they would realize, like, okay, these people obviously have problems, they have addictions, their lives suck, but we're going to treat that by, like, putting them in prison and destroying their lives where they're going to lose their home, they're going to lose their job, they're going to lose their family, and they're going to be put in a building with a bunch of hardened criminals where they get raped and all this. And that's that's the answer. So it doesn't have anything to do with helping people. The drug war was never about helping people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you said, putting people in prison, nonviolent drug users is pretty, pretty insane if you think about it. There's no way... You're probably going to come out there traumatized. That you're not. You're going to struggle to get a job because you have a criminal record, which means you're most likely to go back into maybe selling drugs or something illegal because that's your only source of income, and you need food and you need money at the end of the day. And I mean, in America, especially, obviously, the, the rates of, as you said, rape. You know, people getting killed in there. I remember. I think it was the documentary. It was either Culture High or the house I live in, and it was about. Uh, someone who went there just for kind of smoking weed and he kept telling the prison guards that he had a peanut allergy and they wouldn't listen and then he ended up uh, dying from that allergy and he, you know, he would have never been in there and it was something so minor that you think they could have sorted and it's just insane that that's kind of the idea is to put people in prison but if it was your own child or you know own friend there's no way you want to put them in prison because you'd be like, they're a good person. They, you know, they're not like that. But when it's other people, they can just kind of put it into another category and kind of almost dehumanize them in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the people, even that I met when I was in the uh, the prison camp at Joe Ohio, I mean, there was a guy I met in there that they had found, like, literally specks of residue of, of speed, in a, like in a baggie in his car, like a crumb. And here's this guy going to jail for like a crumb. I mean, it it doesn't have anything to do with like helping people or helping society. They're just trying to fill that place. It's a business. It's just a business. It's all it is. Yeah. So you've given me uh, over an hour, so we'll we'll wrap it up. Just with a couple small kind of last questions. So okay. kind of what is your idea of what? drug legalization should look like. There's lots of different kind of views within the community, obviously. You know, you have Portugal, and I think the Czech Republic, where they have all drugs decriminalized, which just means you can't go to kind of prison for it. It's still legal, uh, and it's not regulated and actually legalized. It's just you basically can't go to prison. So kind of what is your are you for legalization, decriminalization, and then if you, I guess, are for legalization, you know, how should the access be? Should it be alcohol and cigarettes, or should it be a little bit different? It's tricky. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I have, like, some answer for that. I mean, I definitely believe in decriminalization across the board. Uh, you know, the problem, I mean, for one thing, anything that grows out of the earth that people will just kind of buy a plant, yeah, that everything should be legal. Like, if if, if you can just, if it grows as a plant and people want to consume a plant, that should just be taken out of the equation 100%. People should be allowed to grow it at home, do whatever they want. And no one's going to buy it. I mean, if everybody can grow marijuana, it becomes more than – like the value just – and that's what that's what I experienced in California, like firsthand was, you know, I watched a pound of marijuana go from being worth $4,000 to practically can't even give the stuff away, you know. People would be like, oh, the terpenes aren't quite to my life, just like the terpenes. Like, what? You know what I mean? People become so picky, and and, uh, and that's what it's like because it's just everywhere. So that's one category. But, you know, it does get trickier when you get into white powder and pills. And 
people being able to make stuff and sell stuff and, you know, kids being able to buy pills over the Internet and and buying white powder from some guy on the street corner. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, it's it's tricky. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, if, if um, like I said, I mean, I, w- I, you know, if somebody wants to use cocaine, you know, cocaine, I wish they could at least, I guess, get coca leaves at some you know store or try coca tea i mean i don't know if it's any good i don't i don't know i'm just and or poppies or so you know or natural states of things so um you know so how do you control that if somebody wants to be if somebody wants to use drugs uh and be responsible about it i mean I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that. I'm not sure how that looks. Whether that's going to be handled by the pharmaceutical companies or what. But now, now the fentanyl thing is is throwing a real monkey wrench into even all that now. Because from what I hear, people uh, from what I hear, people in Los Angeles are afraid to even buy anything anymore because they're afraid fentanyl will be in everything because it's a way of just spiking stuff with this cheap thing that gets people really high. Um, and I have seen some people that have had really bad reactions to designer drugs and things like that. So, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody should be locked up for using or possessing. Um, but yeah, if somebody, if somebody is selling something dangerous, something that somebody gets caught selling something dangerous, well, yeah, that, that should be against the law. It should be, it should be against a lot of hurt people. It should be against a lot of destroy property or hurt people or ruin people's lives, you know, on both sides. So, um, but I'm not going to sit here and, and, and pretend like I, I know what the answer is. It's it's tricky. It's tricky. Who knows how this is all going to go? But I mean, if I would like to think in the future that if somebody wants to like say, I'd like to try and see what heroin was like, you could try it without having to like go to Skid Row. And you know what I mean? You know, I I don't know. I don't know what the answers are. You know, I, I really don't. Yeah, I would, I would have to agree. With you. I'm not really sure in my head the whole way legalization would work. I think the first step would be to decriminalize all drugs, so no one is going to prison for it. But I don't really think that's far enough because you don't know about the purity of it. It's still in the hands of the black market because it's you know not regulated. You know, I don't think it should be maybe in shops like alcohol and cigarettes where you can just buy some heroin in your local kind of supermarket. Uh, but there could be maybe something in between. You know, you go to a pharmacy or a specific place. Because at the end of the day, I kind of agree with the line of thinking that, it's, you know, it's your body. You know, you should be able to kind of do what you want with it. You know, if you commit a crime while you're on it, you know, harm someone else. Different issue, same as alcohol, same again, people like, oh, can't legalize this drug because everyone's going to drive uh, while they're on it. I'm like, well, if you can drive while you've been drinking, there's laws for that. That's a kind of a separate issue. But, yeah, to kind of round up uh, from my last couple of questions, I guess. Um, so last question. Um, so, yeah, what, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, again, we kind of, before we start speaking, you, you've done this, oh, done this uh, documentary. That's uh, in my life. You did a documentary uh, about uh, kind of Bulgaria in 2019, so you just want to kind of point people to that and anything else you might be working on. Yeah, I mean, uh, I did a documentary kind of, it's it's more of, it was just researching Russia's corruption towards uh, countries, and so it was kind of, you know, we were kind of going after Putin long before this whole uh, Ukraine thing broke out, so it's it's kind of interesting to go back. It's kind of a, a travel doc Um Called Shadows of Sophia. You can find it out there. And, uh, currently I'm working on a thing that involves ranches. Completely different. It's not, not a political thing. Trying to do some entertainment with some good storytelling and, and we're in development stages. So it's kind of top secret, but we're working on a, on a TV series that involves, uh, Texas and big ranches and so forth. We're going to make the real, yeah. we're, we're going to make the real Yellowstone. How come uh, you did a documentary on that? That's pretty specific because obviously, you know, most people would probably focus on, you know, you being from the U.S. government, kind of their influence around the world. So how come you thought, uh, you know, doing it specifically about Russia and, you know, in Bulgaria and other states? I just had an opportunity to open up that I was able to, to go there and, and do that. And so 
I don't know. I just thought it was fascinating to to study the corruption of Russia. I think it's it's you know it's a giant corrupt crazy place, and so I thought it was fascinating. I, I grew up fearing Russia my whole life and hating Russia just from my childhood and what I was taught. And as an American, you know, we were born into the Cold War and all that. So I thought it just it's I've always been fascinated by Russia. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't disagree. To be fair, I mean, Russia is a massive country. Again, because I'm from the UK, you know, most of the stuff I consume is about kind of what our government of the US and kind of NATO does. It, w- it would be interesting to kind of see the other coin of that, you know, in Russia and China and kind of seeing some of the corrupt practice that they do. So, again, I'll, I'll put that on the screen and I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. But I'd like to thank you for coming on and giving me your time. Uh, and I hope to kind of see your, your, your next documentaries or if you ever do one uh, about the war on drugs again, I'll be the first one to watch it. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much.